Hello, everybody. We are just getting situated. Um, just give us a few minutes to, not, not even a few minutes, just a little bit of time to get everything lined up and we will get started on today's version of the MSP initiative. Okay. Today's speaker is Eric Pinto. Welcome to the MSP initiative. Appreciate you for joining from sunny Dallas, Texas, right? That, that is right. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, man. I mean, you know, the weather here in, in Philadelphia is starting to finally, you know, spruce up a bit. You know, people are actually interested in going outside for a change. So, you know, it'll be nice to get Very some nice. fresh air once, uh, once the weather picks up. I think we're going to hit 80 degrees this weekend. So looking forward to it. Well, you know, you can go Just, out, you can hang out, do all the restaurants. Have a great time. Yeah, we're still, I know Texas has opened up. We're, we're still able to do just like pick up and, and take out kind of thing. So, um, you know, still not in a position where we can actually go and just kind of do the table, you know, restaurant thing, but we're looking forward to that whenever we can. We opened up. I've, uh, I've not ventured out. I've, I've stayed in my bunker for the past, uh, eight weeks. And I think that, uh, <laughs> I can, I can do another couple of weeks before I get out. No, I totally, I totally, uh, I totally appreciate that. So, you know, what, you know, a couple of questions while we're just finishing the boot up process here on the, on the multi-streaming. Um, so, you know, so you haven't uh, ventured out, but generally speaking, are people kind of out and about, or are you feeling like everyone's in the same zone you are? Uh, so I think it's, it's, I think it's interesting here in Texas. I think that there's a sort of a, a unique perspective, uh, I'm not going out, but uh, but there a good amount of people around me are sort of, sort of starting to come out. You can tell that the stores are a bit busier. Um, or, you know, people are now able to go to a restaurant. I think at 25% capacity. Uh, so things are starting to return to normal from a business perspective, which I think we all want, right? Yeah. So what about the small businesses around you, right? I mean, that's the big hang up with most of the country, right? That the big box stores never really shut down per se. That's right. uh, but the small guys really have been kind of hamstrung. Yeah. The small businesses on the retail side certainly, I think, took the hit, right? I mean, um, you're right. Walmart never closed. Target never closed, right? So the smaller store, uh, even the smaller hardware stores, you know, re really took a, took a hit. Um, where, where other guys didn't. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we are starting to see sort of a return. Um, we've also seen a lot of innovation. I think that, that for the smaller business, uh, those that were agile and, and able to sort of adapt, uh, you know, were able to get messaging out across social media to say, hey, my restaurant is not open, but we're offering, you know, a delivery service for free or, or you, know, uh, you know, other ways that you could still uh, you know, engage, you know, and, and consume from them, uh, you know, in the, in the existing market. No, absolutely. And we're definitely seeing a lot of that innovation, you know, across, across the country, um, not to get uh, too political or anything like that, because who needs that? But uh, there was the big national news headline with the, uh, the hairstylist, right. And the hair salon, Sure. Um, which, how, how's that gone? How, how is that received locally? Right. Cause I feel like the national, uh, you know, string and opinion may be slightly, slightly different than what you feel locally. Yeah, this, this would be completely off topic, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the, the, re I think there was a, a mixed reaction. I, I think that, that quite honestly, that was, uh, you know, played to political advantage, right. On, on all sides. It's really interesting. I, you know, in, in what we're dealing with right now, um, I, there have been sort of rules and guidelines and sort of the best practices set out. And, and I, I guess I can tie this back into security and compliance, but you know, best practices have been laid out in, in terms of how things should go. What's, what's, what's uncomfortable for people here is that those best practices, what should happen, doesn't necessarily align with what people want to happen. Right. So, uh, and, 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 and I'll draw the connection, right. So in, in security or compliance is similar, right. Um, what, what needs to happen to secure the data for an environment to, is, is sometimes at odds with what is, you know, sort of easy to use or easy to access or, you know, sort of fun for the team. Right. So, um, 
but I, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer of having sort of a, a game plan in place. And um, I think that the, the governors and, and the, in the uh, mayors that are, that, are, that are following a game plan, I think they're doing the best that they can. And, and, I, and I really just sort of, sort of champion it and get in line and, and, and I'm trying to do my best to, to, to follow along. No, fair enough. Um, so, uh, you know, since, you know, one last kind of off topic thought, although, you know, you never know, I could come up with something else. Um, you're a pretty heavy traveler, I'd say, uh, when things are in normal yeah. time. So mm -hmm. what's your gut feel, right? Rest of 2020. Yes, no, maybe. Do I see, so do I see the inside of a plane in 2020? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think that um, we're all sort of hopeful for a, you know, fall return to at least some level of normalcy in our, in our markets, right? So, you know, could we go to a regional, uh, a regional get together uh, in October or so? Maybe. I think it's, okay. I think it's, I think it's possible. I'm not ruling it out. I'm not ruling it out just yet. I'm just, you know, taking the opinion, right? I think everybody's just trying to feel it out. And you happen to be in a state that's kind of ahead of the game a little bit in terms of the, uh, the lockdown reopen situation. So I figured that out. Yeah, yeah, but that, that does, I don't think that that should be a barometer for, <laughs> for what's possible. I think everyone's just sort of making their own bets. And I, I think that we're going to have to just let, this, let what happened happens. Fair enough. All right. So let's get back to like the actual theme of today's um, like thought um, brain, brainstorming. We have, a, we have a theme? We have a theme, I George? Think we do. I think we okay. do. I think the okay. theme for today, today's MSP initiative is uh, beyond COVID-19, assessing the damage and changes in the security road ahead. So, you yeah. know, let's bring that to like actual street language. Um, a lot of people duct taped and bubble gummed and glued their situation together because everybody overnight damn near uh, had to work remote. Um, I think me and you are pretty comfortable working remote if we're not on the road, you know, working from our, you know, wherever we're at. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think a lot of people rush to get their customers, you know, working from home. Uh, a lot of um, things that they wouldn't normally do were done. Um, and I'm not sure all of that has necessarily been remediated. Right. I think they're still running under duct tape, bubble gum land. Uh, to some degree. So let's start off with um, what is the larger concern with people who are still in that realm, right? The non-business sure. machines, the home networks, the home computers, the shared computers with the kids, like all of that uh, applies. What's the biggest first thought on that front? Yeah, uh, what an interesting space that we're in. Not only, you know, when we, when we look at these things, you know, either as technologists and service providers, managed service providers, or, you know, as security professionals, when we look at the, at this landscape, I don't think we ever, I don't think we ever imagined a trajectory that, that would end up with, not only am I, you know, forced to work from home, you know, you, you can sort of plan for that, right? You can say, hey, if there were a flood, fire, natural disaster, what would we, what would we do as an organization, right? Um, and I think that that's sort of the plan that everyone had in place was if there was flood, fire, national disaster, what would we do as an organization to, uh, to, to have some level of normalcy for my employees to work remotely for a period of time? That was, that was the plan that everyone sort of mapped out in their head, right? Two weeks, three weeks a month, you know, sort of a thing. What we're faced with now is not only that, right? Whether it's two weeks or two months or, or longer, but the fact that what you brought up, it's I'm home, the wife is home, the kids are home, everyone needs access to the same network at the same time, maybe the same devices at the same time, depend, depending on what you've already had. You know, if you've got multiple kids, do you have four or five, you know, computers laying around ready to go? Or are you, are you handing them actively your work computer because that's the only thing you've got in front of you? And, you know, he needs to get to math class, right? Like the dynamic of what we're seeing today could not, could not, or was not really thought of, right? Um, so that, that said, what, what, where do we go from here? I think that there are, I think that what's going to happen is uh, as a service provider, you've got a couple of choices. You could uh, just sort of 
leave it where it is and, and, and hope, you know, get everybody back to their office and, you know, ho hope that no one sort of asks questions about what happened <laughs> in, in between. Uh, but I think that the smart, I think that what we're going to see is, is, a, is an intent from the business community, the owner community, to have a complete after action report. I think that you should expect that your partners, your customers are going to come back and say, okay, you know, we're a month back, we're a couple of months back, walk me through what, what happened, walk me through some, maybe some of the billing, <laughs> walk me through, walk me through what, what our risks were, walk me through what our risks are, and walk me through what my risks will be should this turn again later this year, next year, or whenever. Sure. I, I agree with that 100%. I mean, so, 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 here's my, so here's my next question then along those lines. Um, the security assessments and the security posturing that was done before everybody went home, I think that's pretty, you know, deliverable. Um, I'm not sure how deliverable the home networks and the Chromebooks and the iPhones and the Chromecasts and the, all of the, uh, you know, the home devices and the home networks. I, I mean, unless, unless these come, unless the service providers manage their service providers are going to go and start evaluating these home networks after the fact, or even now, um, I'm not sure. Right. Is that happening? Do you, do you suspect that people are going to go and do that? Oh, so what, 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 what we saw uh, was an immediate sort of grab for what can I put on the, on these assets to monitor them remotely. So, um, which brought up a couple of sort of legal challenges, but I think you may have even gone over in your, in your previous uh, interviews, but Hey, we can put an, we can put an agent out. We can have an agent that will monitor and see what's going on in these machines. a corporate owned machine what happens when that's an employee owned asset you know what happens when that's their computer what what legally can i can i can i do to monitor it what can i legally require my employee to do in terms of putting software on those machines i think those were a lot of the questions that, that people were starting to ask and what what ultimately happened uh was people just said you know what forget it and they and they sort of have, have been really lax in in the focused security on these on these third party assets um that's got to stop quickly right so very quickly i think we need to um we're going to need to rein in on what assets can 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 access what data and and if it's not if you haven't already locked that lock that in um and then moving forward again having a better game plan so a better a better ability to deploy out in mass access to critical critical systems. But for the partner, for, for the service provider, it's even trickier. You know, for the service provider, it's, it's understanding the customer well enough to know what data they, they, they're, they're transacting, right? What, what type of material they're protecting, what needs to be protected, having those real conversations with them. These may be the same customers that have sort of brushed you off when you've said, hey, we need to tighten up on security we need to put in some, some compliance tools. And they maybe brushed it off or said, hey, that's handled with my medical record system or that's handled with the, this other system. And I think now it's time to turn back around and, and ask the, you know, do the true due diligence and ask the question specifically, okay, what did you do during this time period? What was at risk? Let's understand it together. Uh, and then let's have, a, let's have a really solid game plan should this happen again, because the, 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 the trusting that, oh, it'll all work out, a strategy. In fact, it's not a strategy at all. So let's, let's go down that road. So do you, as somebody in the security space, um, have a stronger or, or recommended um, roadway for accessing what should be company um, data, right? I don't care if it's, uh, you said you mentioned EHR for medical, it could be documentation in OneDrive, you know, from a file sync and share, it could be email, uh, it could be a bunch of different things, right? So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, like VPN, uh, unless it's filtered in some way, it's wide open, right? I mean, the home computer is now on the corporate network and remotely and, you know, 
whatever happens, happens. I mean, that's probably the worst case scenario, I would think. You know, is it virtual desktop? Is it, um, you know, is it some sort of other, you know, secure space from a web standpoint? Like, what's your recommendation on the bet, you know, on what should be happening rather than whatever works? Yeah, so I, I I think all of the above, right? So two factor two factor is, is is something that I think you're seeing put into place more uh, more than it's ever been uh, as an authenticating measure. Um, all of the sort of normal routes in terms of encryption, in terms of uh, in terms in terms of having secure access and VPN. Um, if those, I, I think the, the routes the routes to securing that data were already sort of hardened in, in, in there. It's whether or not people adopted them as they had to push people out of the office, right? So the opportunity to put in a VPN, have a robust, a robust VPN uh, solution that's accessible by all, all parties is actually not hard to do. Uh, creating you know, remote desktops and having a virtual instance uh, of the network and being able to log into that is not hard to do. But were, were these things being done beforehand and, um, if they weren't, it, now it is time to to really embrace these technologies and start deploying them. Okay. Uh, and, deploying, and deploying them where they're used, right? So I'll give you an example. My my mother is working still. She she works for a company. They said, hey, we've got a VPN, log in. <laughs> that meant nothing to her when she got home. She had her laptop. She had all of her resources. But how to do, how to get to that thing in real time was something that they had not spent any 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 effort on or training on, right? So I think as service providers, it's also an opportunity for for us to come in as and provide the guidance and the training and that and that awareness, uh, you know, sort of level of, around the technologies that are, that you've already got, right? These technologies are here are here. They're just being underutilized and they're being underutilized because there's no training. I, I'm I'm gonna tell you, I know a lot of people who just went for quickest, fastest, dirtiest. They didn't really think about security. And I hope that they're thinking about it now, uh, but these people may be on probably not the most locked down solutions just because it was done so quickly. But from a, from a, a liability standpoint, right? We had Brad Gross on you know, Pat, you know, a couple sessions, like you mentioned, and we talked about you know, how the legal aspect comes in. Um, and you like you know, the challenges, right? With, you know, non-corporate based computers and all that other jazz. But at the end of the day, I mean, let's talk about, mm -hmm. I mean, right now we're seeing a double down by the bad guys in terms of the phishing scams, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the clickbait, in terms of the things to get people to get caught off guard from a security standpoint, I'm seeing the, you know, the, you know, the ransomware stuff is still out there in, in some format. I'm seeing the, the, Hey, you know, uh, transfer money because it looks like I'm a vendor, but I'm really spoofing your, your inbox. All of this stuff that was happening before seems to be happening now uh, in duplicate or triplicate almost, right? It's going up exponentially now that this has been happening. Um, there's gaps now. There's issues, right? So like, yeah. you know, where, where do we start here, right? Because from a liability standpoint, you know, like it just seems like there's a lot more holes open than there were before. Is, are there more? I'll challenge that. Um, and I'll challenge it. I'll challenge it by agreeing, which is weird, right? So number one, we've seen, we've seen, hundreds of thousands of, of new threats um, emerge out of, out of COVID specifically. We've updated our systems uh, for over 150,000 different threat indicators around, around the last three or four weeks, right? So we've seen, we've seen this and we continue to see it in terms of updating our threat intelligence. Are these tactics new? They're not, right? Is the risk itself new? No. Is the data new? No. It's, it, I think that it's only got a, a light shined, shined on it because it's affecting businesses in a, way that, in a way that it hasn't before because they're now all distributed. Everyone is everywhere. They, you, don't, you can't just put a lock around the corporate network and call it good. Um, so I think it's, it's, its level of affect is greater. I think that, I think that the, human, the human error side uh, is greater right? Because we're more prone to make a mistake because we're doing things in a way that we've never had to do them before. So that, so that finance person, that accounting person, that controller gets the email and it says that you need to transfer these funds and then they 
sort of start doing it because it said, you know, it said, you know, PPP and that's what they were trying to get, right? So now, now you're, you know, effectively giving away the keys to your bank, you know, because it isn't something that you've ever had to tackle before. So I think that this comes down to, again, a level of training and awareness and guidance that this community in, in particular can, um, can deliver. So I, you just brought up something I didn't even think about. I mean, with all these people gotten, you know, with PPP, you know, small businesses, um, I don't think you're going to get your loan forgiven if you sent your money to a bad guy. No, no, <laughs> I, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think that's the way it's going to work. Um, but that, but that is a real risk, right? Um, especially because it's been extremely confusing confusing and people have been applying through multiple banks and multiple people are involved and the ability to target that as a as a threat actor is it's is pretty easy right you <laughs> if you send out a hundred thousand or a million you know uh, alerts or emails about ppp that you're bound to get someone to click back and say hey thanks for responding to me right and you appear that you're the bank right yeah like it's bound to work um you know so I, so i think we're, we, we've seen it, it obviously an uptick there but then all around covid really um but again this this is this is more human i think that the systems have always been there you can you can buy them you can deploy them you have to have those business conversations with the with the with the owners with the business owners and say hey this is something we need to do and i think those are real conversations financially but the other side doesn't really cost anything in terms of just getting this the, the staff to understand that you know the way that things were done before will not work in the new normal okay so let's so let's go through a couple of yeah you know, let's shift to like all right there's clearly a challenge those challenges aren't going away they're getting diff more difficult to deal with based on the distributedness right mm -hmm. what do you recommend as a security professional to try like what are the best things that or ways to train your people on not getting uh, duped, right? What, what, you know, what are the top couple of things that they should learn? Yeah, so um, I, I think that the the focus on on phishing, I think I think is a, a solid one. I think that's something you've we we've seen um, uh, with 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 effective result. Um, I think it's something that, and, and there are a number. I won't name names, but there are a number of companies now that that will provide that service to you either for free uh, or for or for a very low low fee as, as part of an awareness campaign. Um, we see it more so with compliance, uh, you know, tying back to, so, to some of the services that we provide. We see it more so with compliance because it's been a requirement to do training and awareness, right, with, with compliance. It's sometimes gone ignored. And, I, and again, I think that there's, there's going to be a, a refocus and a resurgence towards, um, towards doing things the right way and getting in line. So let's talk about the... I mean, you know, I think everybody's run into it, but how how does the whole non corporate resource issue affect the cyber liability coverage stuff? You know, like mm. it, it, it now there's a you know the insurance company is going to do everything they can to not pay the claim, right? That's how they stay in that business. Is, that is what they do. <laughs> so I, I love the I love this push last year. Eighteen and nineteen was a year of I'm buying cyber liability insurance. Great. If you're not doing everything else you were supposed to do, you just you're just paying money for, for something that's not going to help you, in, in, you know, when you need it. Now, or at least, at least not to the level that you need it to, right? So, so what does this open up? It opens up all types of of, of issue because if you if you're allowing a, a corporate user, a business user, to access sensitive material from a privately owned machine that you have zero monitoring, zero awareness of, zero control over. You voided. You voided everything. It, in my opinion, I'm no, I'm no lawyer, but you, you voided uh, at least the spirit of of the contingencies that are built into uh, the uh, liability insurance. Well, that's a. That's a uh, I mean, everybody better be concerned about that, right? I mean, they better actually go and find out what their policy says. Uh, and if you haven't looked at it recently, probably ahead. You know, do it now before a problem happens, right? Because you don't know when it's going to pop up, but you surely want to know if you're going to be covered. And if if not, as Brad Gross said in our previous uh, session this week, um, whenever you go to adjust your policy, there's a period of time before that policy change takes effect. 
mm. could be 30 days, could be whatever. And, and that's like a gray zone, right? Um, so that's definitely concerning. All right, so let's move forward, right? Um, Compliance-based industries, right? What happens if I have a customer who is HIPAA, you know, you know, like I know we, we've talked about these relaxed HIPAA rules, but that was more for delivering telemedicine. That wasn't necessarily for the rest of the data protection, right? Well, like, well, no, that's I think I think everyone got a pass. Again, my opinion, I don't know. <laughs> I think everyone sort of got a pass uh, when, when when the administration said that you know relaxed HIPAA rules. Um, there is a bit of a pass currently. I, I don't know how long you can lean on the on that pass to you know moving forward. So I think that um, everyone got a pass to say, hey, if you need to get people in motion, kind of do it. But again, we're six we're six weeks, eight weeks into this now. It's game plan time. If you don't have a game plan about how to, about how to move forward in this normal even whether this is going to stay the same it's going to adjust slightly it could go back you should have a plan for this that is actionable moving forward certainly now if not you should be honing in on it now fair enough so with all the you know back to the concept of distributed um uh, monitoring the firewall kind of doesn't work now right because there's now a Every, there's how many networks in play, right? There's home networks, there's mobile networks, there's multiple internet providers, multiple people everywhere, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. maybe there's one person in the office because they're the only person showing up for social distancing or whatever, right? So like, are we now really going back to endpoint monitoring? Is that the only thing to, that can be done? Or like, I, think that, I, think that, I think that's really dangerous. And I do see, I do see this probably because of the low cost of deployment, I see this sort of intent towards, hey, well, let's just monitor these, the endpoints individually. Um, I think that that's very dangerous. I think if, if, if the, it, it really depends on the environment, but if we're looking at a traditional office environment that is stemming from some sort of core network, uh, and then you're VPNing into that network or you're using uh, remote desktops into that network, then you have to still monitor that core network infrastructure somehow that the less emphasis maybe on the firewall if you've got less people in the office but that also will will change but um but but still an emphasis on that network data right the um the sensitive data that they're either transacting uh or maintaining right so when that when that data is either in, in motion or at rest you have to you have to make sure that you're securing it as well. You can't just say, "Well, I'll just watch all the endpoints and and if they touch that data, then I'll know it," because invariably the 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 threat actor is going to come through an endpoint that is unprotected, right? The threat actor is going to or the, which could be an endpoint like I don't know, like a thermostat on the network could be anything, right? So um, you know, trusting that your you know your upgraded antivirus is going to get you through, I think. Is not is not smart. That said, um, we 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 deploy out as a uh, with both the network approach and a and a uh, endpoint approach, uh, so that we can triangulate on on threat. Okay, so are the people that have their their workloads right? Let's say they're entirely virtual desktop, whether it's an Azure or a Google or whatever. Uh, maybe it's just a, a dedicated server in a colo, and all they're doing is remoting in, right? Are they immune to what's happening outside of that environment? Are they safe? Is it okay? Do we, do we not care what happens outside of those terminal windows or remote sessions? Well, they, they can't. Uh, no, I mean they can't be immune. I think that that it's it's a it's a better it's a more centralized way, obviously, of of, of deploying access, right? Because you can then monitor the one thing, and you can monitor what's what's engaging that thing. Um, but you still have to look at what they're using to get onto those tools. And, and could that could that access point be also compromised in one way or another? Or 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 is the user, you know, again, you can secure everything and then the user just answers the wrong email and now you've just, you know, human error has has that spilled threat, right? So, um, okay. I, I so think there is no there is no perfect solution. 
No, I get that. I mean, and, and everybody's deployed things slightly differently, right? Which is mm -hmm. why it's so complicated to figure, you know, an umbrella, all right, across all parties. Um, so from a network monitoring standpoint, then, what are the things that you would look for that would be a red flag, right? I mean, endpoint monitoring is one thing. We said that that's limited, right? It's a little bit tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. So then if network monitoring, the traffic going across is what's the other missing link, mm -hmm. What exactly in that flow are we actually looking for? Yeah, so beyond you know signature-based discovery, like what you traditionally would see with 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 an antivirus, uh, you know we are we are looking for uh, the known traits of of of, of malware, uh, but we're more so looking for things like uh, malicious or anomalous behavior, right? So uh, a machine giving a call to other machines to uh, you know, to shut down system restore, things like that, right? So um, the, what, why, why it's important to do that on the network side versus, because you could say, hey, I could do that on the endpoint, and you could do it on your known endpoints, but what we found is that your, your offending party might be an unknown or unprotected asset, and we've seen that multiple times. So we've seen a machine on network that was otherwise unwatched, uh, uh, you know, spitting out or vomiting out, um, you know, uh, what would be ransomware, uh, you know, to all the mach other machines on the network. And it was like whack-a-mole trying to get it because you keep shutting it down at, at, the, at the device. Meanwhile, the source is still, you know, still doing, it, doing its thing. So we're able to see that regardless of, of device type, regardless of OS or manufacturer, we, we can see, okay, this IP, this MAC address on network is, sending out a call or, 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 or has activity on, uh, from the device that is very suspicious. And we're able to then triangulate uh, by using our endpoints to say, okay, well, when this MAC address tried to, uh, tried to communicate with this machine, what was it doing? And we, we take the two different data points at, uh, in our security operations center, we're able to say, okay, these two things together are problematic. So not to make a really weird analogy, but you know, like, hey, COVID-19 testing is only good for in the moment, right? You take your test, they come yeah. back, to you, they let you know you had it or not at that time. This, what we're talking about here can't just be in the moment. There's got to be a continuous no. effect to it, right? Or else it's almost pointless. Yeah. Yeah, that's the difference between some of the other stuff that you see out there where it's like, well, you know, we, we check for vulnerabilities, like, you know, we got a cool solution that runs like every week. That's great every week, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, if I, if, if I get a device, if I get a Linux device or a Mac on my network and it's, comprom it's compromised, Linux device compromised on Thursday, I'm not gonna do that other scan until Sunday night at midnight. You know, that's three days that, that the system's running. Uh, you know, havoc on the network, unscanned, unchecked, right? So we really believe in a real-time approach to, uh, to our monitoring. Uh, but I, whether it's us or anyone else, I think that that is just that is an approach that businesses need to take when they're securing uh, sensitive data. And it's not an approach that I'm mandating. It's an approach that's mandated by compliance. Mm -hmm. Read between the lines. Even, even with HIPAA, if you read between the lines, they're, they're very prescriptive about what they want you to be able to do in the event of a breach, in the event of an incident. It's not about... You know, it, it's, it's, it, they, they, you, you need to be able to go in and, and know what's happened, discover what's happened, read through logs in real time. And, and most people are just not sort of built for that without having things in place before. And that's exactly where I was going next, funny enough. I mean, there's a lot of technology that the IT service providers of the world are using. There's just, if you ask the average service provider, and I just did a poll with a group earlier today, and they're, at, they're using something on average of, uh, 25 plus tools on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot to manage. And they generate a ton of noise, almost like alert fatigue, right? That's they just exactly, the point where, it's almost exactly like alert fatigue. But the problem the, the my big concern here, when you're talking about continuous monitoring, because that's the only way that this works mm -hmm. is how do you 
cut through the noise to figure out what's actually real. Is it a, an attempt that somebody's trying to breach the network? Is it a mal malware that's uh, floating through? Is it actually a ransomware that's that's in the beginning stages? Like how much noise are we having to, you know, kind of flutter through in order to get the actual real results? Yeah, this is where machine learning, um, you know, in AI have been really helpful, right? So having, having a tool set that can take small pieces of data, small incremental changes, and, and because it sees it sees them not only across one, de one device, but across all devices, it can start making some determinations, right? So the system itself can say, okay, with this indicator, this indicator, this indicator, and this indicator, this looks an awfully lot, lot like something's happening, right? And it'll then spit up an alert to my team. My team then manually goes in, uh, takes takes a visual sort of assessment of what's happening, and then makes a determination. But um, it's the, the changes that you'll see happening on a network are so micro incremental that you would never notice them on your own, right? The human eye would just see millions and millions of log of log log data, right? Log files, but not be able to 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 really tell what's happening, right? But um, the system certainly can. So uh, we rely a lot on, on our systems and on, our, uh, on the algorithms that produce results. And then from there, we're able to help our partners. Our goal is to eliminate uh, or really reduce false positives. So right. false um, whatever we can yeah. do to do that, you know, I think it's in, in everyone's best interest. Right. So is there any shortcut to this, right? Alan mentioned earlier, and I, I just seen the chat here, hey, VPN from the corporate network should be on a separate, a subnet so that you can apply different rules. I mean, I think that that's surely been around for some time, but what you're talking about is actual, you know, constant signature based, uh, you know, like log monitoring, right? You know, that's, a, you know, so like one approach is, hey, I'm doing my best to not let the traffic through. In your case, you're actually filtering through this traffic in real time, right? Yeah, yeah. So that, that, that's the difference, right? So the, the, I still believe in it. If you can lock it all down and, 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 and have a, uh, you know, a trust only network, I think that that's, 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 a, that's an approach. And if, if it works for your end customer and you could have rules around that to, uh, uh, to make sure that it doesn't become a burden every time you have to allow, um, I think I think that 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 scenario works um, for us. Whether you were doing that or whether you weren't, uh, the responsibility to monitor the the actual traffic, what's coming in and out, um, is still there. The uh, the 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 responsibility to monitor for intrusion, right? Is, is still there and, and access to machines is still there. So uh, we, we really are working in line with what uh, some of the mandates are from a, not only a security best practice perspective, but, but a compliance perspective. Okay. So if you were coming in as a, a consultant for an insurance company who had a cybersecurity claim, I know this is a weird scenario, but it's a true yeah, one. We actually, we actually do this. So go ahead. Okay. What are the first things that you stumble upon that basically wouldn't validate the whole story? <laughs> I mean, if you're doing it on a basis, you got to know, like, hey, yeah. you don't have to put names into it. Give me something that's happened, right? Give me something that's actually come up. Well, uh, so a lot of policies will, will be fairly specific about uh, – about your access, not only your access to logs, but that you're monitoring those logs. So, so sort of easily, um, if something, if we discover, we, if we discover something on the network that's, uh, let's say been there for a good amount of time, uh, uh, more than a reasonable amount of time. So we've seen things on network where uh, the network has been compromised for six months, eight months, a year or longer, right? Um, that, po that policy probably has multiple provisions in it that would say that you, are, that you are supposed to be not only actively monitoring for these things, but also uh, more, more passively doing uh, vulnerability checks every quarter and things like that. If you've gone a year with, with, with problems on the network and they've gone unaddressed completely, even if, even if, even if they're not fixed, you should at least have documented that, that you detected and, and you've got a plan in place. If you don't have any of those things in place, then, then you... You've already worked yourself. Mm. Okay. That's that's interesting. So so let me ask you a qu another question then, which this gets interesting. So what you know, 
from the human aspect, right? Multi-factor, passwords, training, all this, what have you. Um, what happens when, you know, and this may be the tricky part, right? Data is leaving the network through jump drives, CDs, DVDs, whatever, right? You know, like media that's actually leaving. And then they're getting, you know, then they're reassembled on the other side and vice versa, right? That's how they're moving data back and forth. How, how easily trackable is that? You know, like, are we talking endpoint now? Are we talking network? Like, what's the deal? Yeah, so the, the mode of transport then is not network. So that would be that would be an endpoint discovery. The endpoint would have to be uh, set, monitored for uh, the data that's there, the data that's stored, and then the data that's transferred out. Most of the endpoint uh, detection services that are out there would, would do something similar. Um, the problem the problem there is, it, it, and we see it on the network side, is, is really determining what's uh, – what's malicious, right? So uh, for example, we monitor for uh, data exfiltration and, and, and things coming off the network, uh, like to Dropbox or Google Drive, right? We're monitoring that network traffic. Uh, but that's not necessarily malicious, right? In fact, it may be the corporate chosen vehicle, right? So we have to, we have to sit down with the, with the client and, the, and you guys would sit down with your clients and say, okay, we see this activity, is this normal, is it not? And then you create rules around it for the next time, right? So, um, so a lot of the times, it, the first uh, on initial reporting, on initial review, it's really just understanding what the baseline is. What is acceptable? What is not? What's it? And that's why I say okay. how you, uh, it's, oh. it's imperative that the partner, the MSP, is having real conversations, not only with the business owner, but maybe to individual business units. The advertising team, the marketing team may use Dropbox because it, because that's how they communicate with you know their designer right like there there may be tools that are that are used shadow IT right tools that are used internally that the business owner doesn't really bring up so we we sort of do a first audit first review of the network and look at reports after three or four weeks and we start just looking line by line at data right and, and what ports have been used and then we we really work to understand what's normal and what's not normal. So, so that's a good point, right? So if we're talking to the people on the call that are listening and saying, you know what, uh, I want to start figuring out how to do this uh, in a more structured way, right? I have a hodgepodge of solutions, but I don't have anything that's really bringing all this logging, monitoring, analytic, you know, computer AI, you know, monitoring to determine what's good, what's bad. You know, like what are the, what's the first 30, 60, 90 days? What steps do these people have to go through, you know, after they've, adopted this type of technology, security-based technology, to really put themselves in a position to, to get this right? Yeah, I think it's review. It's exactly what I was just saying. It, it's, 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 it's taking a, a, a hard look at not what your client told you they use or told you what they do, but actually what the data is showing you, right? So you want to go through, and then whether you're using what we, what we do, or if you're using an endpoint based solution, uh, spending some real time going through the reporting, going through the data, not just signing up for the service, turning it on, getting a, a, a report, emailing it, maybe emailing it off to the, to the customer. That's what I think a lot of us sort of want to do because we don't have time for other stuff, but spending time, with the um, you know, with the with the with the partner helping the end customer helping them understand what the what the what the data looks like this month and next month by the third month I think you everyone will have a, a clearer understanding I think you'll then understand your baseline but until then I think it's really spending some valuable time in the data in the reporting and with your customer so that so that there is complete alignment so that when situations like this occur there aren't any questions we know what we're going to do we've got a game plan. We know what the we know that we use Dropbox in this way. We use Google Drive in this way. We have got these other vehicles. These are th this is what we're going to use now to go remote. Like whatever that might be. Sure. What, what's your best advice for everyone preparing now for what what's got to be potentially a second wave of this? Right. Yeah. It kind of inclinated earlier in the call here that we said, uh, hey, you know, when this happens again, a lot of the experts think that 
there is going to be a part two of this. So if they didn't get it right the first time around, what do you recommend they should have now start to, you know, get, get it together now, the game plan, as you say, what should be the beginning workings of getting that plan together for round two? Yeah, great. Fantastic question. I think we could, we could probably close it out on this. Um, the, the, everyone got a pass, whether, whether, whether we t we're referring back to the, uh, to the HHS uh, and healthcare uh, pass. Everyone got a pass on this one, I think, because you can say we didn't know. We didn't know that this was going to happen. We never could have anticipated not only one office being shut down, but all 15 of the locations being shut down, you know, across the globe. You know, though these things were unprecedented then, six, eight weeks ago. Now, now we've got precedent. Now we know that this is a possibility. So if this were to happen again, again, this year, next year, or five years from now, uh, there are going to be specific expectations, not only from a compliance regulation standpoint, but I think from every business owner standpoint that, that their technology provider has a plan put together, a way to do this that is as, with as little disruption as possible. So what you're going to charge for that, how you're going to do that is really up to you. Uh, but it will start with, with an understanding of the workflow of that business, the data that that business is maintaining, and, 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 how, and how they're communicating to their customer, whether it's retail, whether it's business to business. What, what does their business workflow look like? And can I replicate this remote? That is, that, is, that, is, that is now the task of every, uh, of every technology service provider to look holistically at the business and say, can I, can I replicate this virtually? Okay. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Uh, sorry, I just had a call come through. I appreciate that, that feedback, Eric. I mean, it's just, it sounds like security is the, you know, the very difficult part of this whole situation, right? And, um, you know, there's is just it, so is, many it, is it though, is it, it's not. I feel like Again, there's so the, many the tool, aspects. The tools have always been here. These are the same tools that we've debated over. You know, I think the, the only difference now and the, the benefit for small business and the benefit for managed service providers is that there has never been better, greater, more affordable access to this type of tool set ever. So you can access SIM technology. You can access, uh, you know, a 24-7 security operations center. You can access these things now that would have cost tens of thousands of dollars, twenty thousand dollars more, uh, for a smaller business to to embrace before. And now it's now it's you know a monthly recurring revenue model in line with the way they do business otherwise. So the tools are there. So what's hard? It's hard to be educated. It's hard to spend time understanding what the risks are, understanding what the customer profile is, and then putting in the right solutions that make sense. It's a time problem, if anything. Sure. Would you, would you, what, what knowledge would you say that um, IT service providers should encourage their engineers and technicians to, 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 to learn more, right? If it's a knowledge problem, right? If they're missing the gap, is there specific education that they should be going out and getting trained on? Right. So I think, I think just similar to, I was reading what Alan put here too about the VPN network and he's absolutely right about it being a separate, a separate network and separate uh, IP subnet. Um, th that sort of knowledge is where, is where everyone is today. Right. So I think everyone, most technologists will have a knowledge set around how to secure a thing. Right. So, so again, and, and not to be super repetitive here, it's what things am I securing? Right? It's not how to secure that thing. I think that's there, right? Uh, you know, I think that if we say two factor authentication, everyone in the room goes, yeah, sure, we know how to do it. So now, how do I, how do I, how do I communicate that down to my end customer, right? How do I make them as knowledgeable as my team, right? Uh, in these areas. And then how do I, how do I, how do I get them to embrace, embrace adoption even when it's more work, right? It takes an extra step for me to log in, to get the login and then go here, right? And then get the code and understand that and then, and then, and then enter it in. That's an extra step in, in getting businesses to understand that that extra step 
is important. I think, again, it's, it's communication down. It's not really what the team needs to know. I think the team, if we identify what the things are, the team will then be able to say, okay, great, let's secure those, those things. But then how do I communicate that down to my end customer and to their staff? That's the, the bigger challenge. I think, yeah, people are afraid of change or they, they push back on it for sure. Or, or they, put, they, push, they push back. They push back and it's, it's, well, I can't sell that. Well, maybe stop selling it. I know it sounds crass. It sounds like, oh, Eric doesn't understand the, 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 the challenge. Well, no, I do. But if, 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 if I've got a customer that's managing sensitive information and they're just flagrant about 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 it and, uh, and they're unwilling to secure themselves in a way that you feel that they should what's going to happen when they when they actually have a breach where is the finger going to be pointed we've seen it we've seen it in the past year forget COVID for a moment we've seen it in the past year multiple times right so Alan again I agree it's this isn't a sales issue this, 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 you, we, have to, we have to understand where the risks are. We have to be able to plainly state that to the part, to the customer. These are the risks. And then we have to have them either accept what needs to happen in terms of, in terms of a strategy to resolve or mitigate or at least monitor or decline that level of service and sign that as well. But this finger pointing that's happening over and over again with the MSB being the target has to stop. I think the industry as a whole could do a lot better, you know, you know understanding the communication string that needs to happen for sure. No right. question. No question about it. E Eric, I, I really appreciate you coming on and just kind of talking about the big picture, right? I think that's, I think a lot of what everyone's hearing on this call was probably what they, they, they've heard in one piece or another. But I think, sure. again, just reminding people that, hey, just because we're in the time that we're in doesn't mean that it all just went away. Uh, if That's anything, right. it got worse. So um, what, any closing thoughts, right? You know, hey, between now and the end of the year, anything that you would tell MSPs to look forward to? Man, uh, I, I look for, I, the only thing I'm looking forward to is, is hopefully getting to see you guys out <laughs> actually on the road um, later, the, later this year, um, I want every, encourage everyone to stay safe during this time uh, and, and to realize that uh, we're, we're good or bad. I think we're, we're in one of the best positions we've been in as, as, as people that can provide the guidance and, and uh, awareness and get people down the road in an area where, where, they, where they need assistance. Security is one of the, is, is probably the number one budget in terms of approval right now in business, at least in mid-market. We see it in mid-market enterprise, certainly, right? It, it is where every other budget has constricted, the security budget is either the same or greater than, than it ever was. So these, so the opportunity has never been been greater for us to go out and, and have these conversations with our, with our, with our end clients. Um, I don't think that we have to explain to them what the potential risk of having to access secure data from remote. I don't think we have to that's not hypothetical anymore, right? So we can have different conversations and much more in-depth conversations about the risks that are that are, that are that are that are that surround that than we've ever had because it's all real now. Yeah, fast forwarded the conversation, hundred well, uh percent. -huh. I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone for joining today. Again, MSP Initiative runs twice a week right now, Tuesdays and Thursdays, one p.m. New York time or Eastern time. Uh, Eric, we appreciate you for coming on board. Uh, I hope everybody got a little bit of uh, knowledge you know, and, and thought around this. And we look forward to everybody joining us again on this upcoming Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, enjoy your weekends. Thanks, George. Have a good one.